almost done. Um, there is uh, our last quiz uh, up on grade scope, similar to quiz five. Um, that will be due 9 a.m. Uh, Friday. Uh, you will not be able to use late days on this last quiz because we're at the end of, of classes, so it has to be turned in uh, on Friday. Um, any questions about uh, final project or, or other stuff at the moment? I uh, yeah, Lisa. I guess how do we know when it's enough and when to stop implementing? Should um, we do the the um the extra features to put in the proposal or is that just if we have time? Um, so I would say the the first thing, like it's more important that it's very convincing that the like basic features are correct than it is that you implement uh, extra features. Um, that said, a like correct bare minimum, not going to get a hundred percent, but um, so like. Asymptotically make progress toward 100% by implementing extra features. Asymptotically. Other questions? Uh, all right, I have a question for you. Um, would it be useful to have another uh, work day on Friday? Yes. 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 Okay. So we will have a, a work day on Friday. We'll start. I'll start with just a short presentation, just to like I want to mention things that we didn't cover uh, this term because there's a lot of top operating systems that we just don't have time for. Um, but we'll spend spend most of Friday uh, as a, a work day in in Olin three ten. Okay. Um, all right. So what is the the topic for today? Uh, I want to talk to you about a kind of further explore the design space of kernels. Um, and really, like, <coughs> we're, we're facing this question of what should the kernel actually do? And it, turns out the sort of set of things that we've been assuming all term is like these are the things the kernel does, these are the things the user does. Um, that's not the only kind of point in this design space. Uh, so today I want to talk about uh, two other uh, uh, two other kinds uh, or approaches to designing a kernel. Uh, one is called the micro kernel. Um, and as the, the, the prefix suggests, this is about making the kernel smaller. Uh, and we'll see the ways in which that, that's done. Uh, I think I'll spend most of the time on this on this microkernel because the, there's a specific example of microkernel I want to talk about. And there's kind of interesting things going on there. Uh, but I also am going to talk a little bit about uh, unikernel, which is a smaller kernel, but uh, not in the same way that micro kernel is smaller. It's about kind of unifying everything into the kernel, and so we'll we'll see see kind of more detail about what that means. So these are kind of the the, the two design approaches I want to talk about, but. This, the answer to this question, what should the kernel do, there's simply no one best answer. It's going to depend on what are you trying to accomplish, what trade-offs do you want to make, what are your aesthetic preferences uh, in, terms of, in terms of software design. Um, to say that the traditional approach where I want to start um, I have Linux, Windows, Mac, OSD. Uh, these all fall into the category of monolithic kernels. Um, and this is 
if we, we think of a kernel as providing a lot of powerful abstractions, uh, and that it's also this kind of one big program. This is like all, like, when we're working with OSV, like, all the different kind of components and modules from the kernel, they're all compiled into, like, one big, one big thing. So they're not sort of, like, the file system isn't isolated from virtual memory, isn't isolated from process management, like, they're just all sort of mixed together. Um, so let's think about these abstractions. What are some abstractions that we've talked about this term, that kind of operating system kernels, um, like OSV or, or Linux, provide to us? Oh. Programs get virtual memory, that is, they have the access to the entire thing, they can do all the with it, and it's like super cool. Yeah, so we have um, virtual memory, and I might just say in general, like, abstractions, shared resources. It's just a huge thing that the kernel does. It, it's providing some layer over a shared resource. It just makes it much easier for applications to, to interact with, or, or makes it invisible, the sharing invisible to the application. Victor? Does this abstraction over shared resources include like multi-processing on one CPU, or multi-threading on one CPU? Um, yes, so th this is a kind of abstraction over the CPU, so we virtualize the CPU via scheduling, we virtualize memory, we virtual memory, yeah. Uh, kind of part of this this general class of things. Uh, other abstractions. So, if I yeah, go on. the file system is probably like, you don't just like say like you only just you say this file. Exactly, file system major abstraction. Uh, some of you have been poking around in the file system code for your final projects. It's quite a complicated abstraction with many layers. Um, but yeah, that, that's a big one. Well, I was going to say just memory management and substituting in like swap when necessary. Um, yeah, and, and kind of one one nice aspect of kind of our our uh, memory management. is it's one of the many forms of sort of indirection that the kernel introduces. So we have virtual addresses, not physical addresses. We have file descriptors, not pointers to a file struct. Um, so on and so forth, kind of all these, these layers of indirection that the kernel uses to, to provide these sort of abstractions. Um, what about if, if, uh, if I'm writing uh, a program that's going to run on Linux, do I need to know what model of hard disk, what model of CPU? No. So there's there's an aspect of portability that these kernels are providing. That means applications don't have to, to know about this stuff. It's just there is a kind of nice interface for interacting with disk for um, creating new processes that sort of isn't dependent on the underlying hardware. Any other abstractions you think of? The communication between processes, like those bits and stuff, is Yeah, there's just like a lot of useful interfaces that are hiding all sorts of complexity that's going on underneath and, and pipes for inter-process communication, um, which is something we'll, we'll talk a lot about when we get to, to microkernels, um, is, is a big one. All right, so we have all these powerful abstractions. Um, and as like I said, kind of all these different abstractions living together in, in, the, same, in the same program um, means that, that to implement, say, um, uh, mapped memory or copy on write or you know, different features that might kind of cut across these different abstractions, it's pretty, it's relatively straightforward because it's all they're all living together. So, one consequence, um, like 
maybe kind of get at by the thing, like, what's an obvious consequence of like ha having a kernel that provides you know everything un under the sun up here? Uh, I mean, it's a lot of bloat for the systems that don't need it. I mean, something a lot smaller doesn't need an entire all of that. Yeah, and, and like our sort of our kind of problems with traditional kernels. Like one of them is. They may be overly general, maybe to an extreme extent, for some applications. Uh, like if I want to, to put out uh, uh, a weather sensing device, attach it to the side of a building, and have it sort of send occasional updates with weather measurements, like I really don't need all of this to do that. Like this is really overkill. So uh, for Certain applications, these kernels may be like overly general, um, and you may imagine like you implemented uh, pipes in OSV, and you might think about one process wants to send a single byte to another process. Like how much work is involved to make that happen in OSV? It's uh, a system call to set up the pipe. A system called a write to the pipe, which is going to involve acquiring locks and writing to a buffer, and then read is going to acquire more, more locks, and like it's just like tons of stuff to just send this one byte um, between processes. So, yeah, that that could be bad. Um, other problems with our that we might encounter with these you know, traditional monolithic kernels. Well, relative to some devices, they're large. Yeah, they're certainly very big. Like something that, that has all this stuff in it, it's going to going to be big. Um, big by itself, like why why is how could big be a downside? Jeremy? It's hard to maintain. You must have the people that know everything. It's like a system architect. Yes, big often means very complex. Um, that if we want to change something, particularly something um, fundamental like this, uh, that's that might be very good. It's not the most robust because like if one part of breaks, everything breaks. There's all one program. So if you have like modules that drive the system, or like the file system crashes, but the rest of it's fine. They're just not. Yeah, it's like a panic kind of anywhere in our kernel might bring everything to a halt. We kind of don't have an easy way to say isolate uh, the file system. And, like the file system has a bug and there's a panic, and I don't have a way to like reboot just the file system necessarily, like because everything's sort of tied in together. Um, so we do have maybe yeah some. Some ways in which it's not as robust to problems in, in just one part of the kernel. Um, I'm going to think of another, besides the complexity of extending it, another consequence of complexity. Uh, is it, I'm not sure if this is so much of a problem, but I mean, it's literally like the amount of memory it takes up to hold the kernel. Um, we certainly have have some some overhead. On that sort of ties into this overhead channel, we might just have to pay for things that we, we don't want to use. Um, but if you think about working on uh, a program that's very big and complex versus one that's smaller and easier to understand, why like why might it be harder to like get the do the thing to the complex code correctly? Because it's complex. <laughs> Yeah, I guess what I'm getting at is like complexity often means you have more bugs uh, because you just can't reason as well about what the code is doing, and there's dependencies that you don't realize, and so you end up with um, like if you could sort of put in the work to understand the complexity and then just like get it right, 
you know, there's that some cost, but it's the fact that there may be all sorts of problems that are just hard to realize um, is another cost of the complexity. Um, and as we've talked about, bugs relate directly to kind of the sort of security guarantees that our kernel can provide. So much easier to make a simple system secure than it is to make a complex system secure. Um, and people will talk about sort of the attack surface of a piece of software, uh, meaning kind of all the different points where it might be might be attacked, um, and some complex piece of software there might be many more points where uh, it could be vulnerable in something that's very simple. Um, one other thing that I um, will will add to this. is these monolithic kernels, a whole bunch of design decisions are just like baked into the kernel. Like you're using Linux, you're using the file system, like it's gonna put the, the blocks of data on the disk where it wants to. Like you're, you're not in control of that. Basically. That design is baked in, which for example, uh, maybe you have a database that is has an index and a specific tree structure, and there'd be some like nice and efficient way you could arrange that tree structure on disk based on how the database is going to access it. The file system has no idea, and so you might end up sort of, the file system might be undermining uh, or preventing possible optimizations because that's sort of just baked in to the cake. Um, similarly, like, if I want to wait for a process that's not my child, I can't do that. Uh, if I want to change some other process's address space, can't do that. Uh, these are designs that were that are baked into the kernel. Can't change them. Um, all right. So that's sort of the kinds of, of kernels that we've been looking at so far. And so let's. Take a look at, at micro kernels. They're sometimes written this way uh, instead of micro spelled out. Um, and so the big idea here is to go from this world where our kind of, uh, all sorts of functionality is we have kind of uh, user processes up here, uh, and then Uh, the kernel uh, down here, and we had like the file system uh, and the network and memory management and the disk driver, so on and so forth, all living in the kernel. And in our micro kernel world, we're making the kernel kind of much smaller, and a lot more is taking place in user space. So we still have our kind of application, but now the file system is just a service running in user space. Uh, so is the disk driver. Um, uh, so is code that's doing some of the memory management. Like all of this is just running in user space. And uh, how kind of what the what the kernel uh, one of the core things that the kernel is going to provide in this scenario is the ability for these different processes to talk to each other. Uh, so if the application wants to do something with files, it will send an inter-process communication. I'll use the abbreviation IPC, but it's going to send kind of some IPC uh, to the file system, and maybe the file system sends an IPC to the disk, uh, and then uh, the file system sends an IPC back to the application to say, like, I did, I did the thing. Um, so the kernel is a much smaller facilitating the communication between all these different things uh, running in user space. Um, and kind of the 1980s saw is kind of where this micro kernel idea sort of saw a lot of attention, at least in kind of academic research. Um, Carnegie Mellon developed a microkernel called Mach, uh, 
um, uh, which was very influential. Um, and kind of to, to preview kind of where things end up, uh, this microkernel idea shows up a lot in um, kind of phone, uh, phone hardware, uh, car entertainment systems, other sorts of kind of small embedded devices. Um, you don't see desktop computers so running microkernels. And we'll talk a little more about that uh, later. Uh, so what were people hoping to achieve when they set out to design these, these um, microkernels? So uh, one would be they're going to be small compared to the, the big um, big monolithic kernels. And as we said, small, easier to uh, make secure, less, less complexity. Um, and in fact, there are techniques to mathematically prove code is correct. Like construct a mathematical proof. Uh, this is usually done with kind of automated systems. They can kind of analyze code with some human input and prove this code over kind of all possible inputs matches this specification. Um, techniques have been developed to do this sort of verification of small to medium amounts of code. Uh, techniques don't exist to verify large pieces of code um, in a feasible way. But if your kernel is small, and there is actually something called SEL4, and L4 is the kind of microkernel I'll use as an example. Um, but there is a kind of a variant of it which has indeed been verified correct, which gives a lot of confidence in the in the security. Like for all possible inputs, like this code is going to do, going to meet this specification, so you kind of have a lot more confidence in its uh, in its correctness. And, and in general, verifying code on medical devices, code code that's flying airplanes, this is this is kind of uh, a useful technique in, in practice. Well, is something like that more secure than like Alpine Linux? Um, I, I don't know kind of what security features Alpine Alpine Linux has. Uh, my understanding is that if you can verify your piece of code, which often isn't possible, if you can, that's like basically as good as you can do in terms of um, security and, and robustness. Uh, I was just wondering, like, how small is small enough to be verifiable? Um, so the uh, I think um, so. This L four kernel on the order uh, I, I think in um, it's like around the size of, of OSV. So I, I looked up OSVs like eleven, twelve thousand lines of code. Um, if you include like uh, the the C and assembly um, uh, and the header files, um, L four is thirteen thousand. Might be uh, I don't know in particular how, how big this is. Um, Linux, Windows, Mac. These are millions of lines. That's we can't verify that at the moment. On. Also, you only verify it's correct to the spec. So the spec is still have like you can't be certain that the spec doesn't allow unintentional. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not an expert in this verification, um, so I don't know exactly uh, exactly the form that input takes to these techniques. Um, but yes, I mean, the, the the verifier can only verify as far as like you can. Um, uh, yeah, I, I believe the verifier needs some sort of specs, so you know you have to kind of think carefully about. About this, but um, it's easier to reason about: is this specification correct? Than is this implementation of the specification correct? So, if you allow humans to decide that the specification is correct, and then a computer can guarantee the implementation meets the spec, that's that's kind of a win. Other questions? All right, so. Uh, small, uh, security, you can verify it. Um, 
It's also easier to optimize small code um, because you have kind of a, you know a smaller uh, kind of particular place uh, or, or smaller region. You can focus on on making it uh, go really fast. So uh, that that was kind of these are all aspirations or goals of the of the microkernel design. Um, another part of optimization is avoiding this overly general piece. We're not going to like pay for like if we we don't need a file system, um, we just don't have it, and we we don't have to spend any time like setting up or, or managing it. Um, similarly, we're we're not going to force these design decisions on on the user. If the user wants to do something different with the file system, they can implement and just run a different one on top of on top of the microkernel. Um, so. By having more things happen at the user level, uh, the idea was we get better modularity. We can kind of take out and, and put in, kind of customize uh, the, the pieces. Um, uh, and also have these be more robust. And this gets down to like a problem with some component of the system. When a bunch of components are inside the kernel, a problem with one of them can, can affect the whole kernel, where we've moved all these pieces out of the kernel, um, and there's a microkernel system called Minix, um, which was actually originally created to be something like OSV, like kind of a small kernel for educational purposes, and over the years has evolved, evolved into a, a kind of Product that's actually like used in practice, um, and I bring it up because it's described as a self-healing kernel, meaning that it's sort of it, as a microkernel, sort of monitoring all the, the pieces that are going on in the system, and if a problem occurs, it kind of knows how to, to restart that and kind of get the system back to a functioning state. And that's something that's a lot harder to do when everything's sort of like uh, all, all interwoven and inside of a model of the kernel. Um, last one I'll mention is uh, a flexibility, the idea that if you had this microkernel, you could actually, um, sort of like a virtual machine manager, Run different styles or, or different operating systems sort of on top of the microkernel. Um, and this is one of the ways in which these microkernel ideas have been very influential, even as microkernels themselves have not um, become super popular. Uh, because a lot of the kind of ideas around virtual machines are kind of, came, uh, kind of descendants of these kind of ideas that, that arose from microkernels. All right, so this is the general idea of a microkernel. These are our aspirations. Uh, so I'd like you to, to take a few minutes and brainstorm with your neighbors. What are some challenges? What, what would be some challenges to actually like making this work, to actually implementing or, or achieving these goals uh, uh, in, in a real microkernel? So going from the sort of monolithic kernel world that we know to something like this, Brainstorm what problems or what challenges might we have to, to solve. All right, let's talk about some challenges. Any thoughts, Bill? You're talking about how any tools or programming languages you use, for the most part, you don't have to create new utilities and you to compile and work on your kernel. Yeah, so there's, there's definitely like Kind of barriers to to adoption or kind of extra kind of development work that is that is needed to actually make stuff make stuff run on on this on a, on a microkernel. Yeah. You probably like still need to do all the complexity anyways. Like you need a file system disk driver. Like you probably need to publish them somewhere because it would be you can't really expect to like write a full file system yourself. You want to have some like 
where they don't do that. So like somewhere someone will publish it, that's stuff anyways. So it's not like you're really safe for you know, it's not like you can't just do it with like you Yeah, that's a that's a fair point. I I, I would say it, the goal of the microkernel is not to avoid the work of implementing a file system should you need it. Um, it's to say you have the ability to not have a file system if you don't need it, and that's probably better. Um, and uh, because the kernel doesn't have to include a file system, it might get some benefits from being small. But absolutely, like essential components like talking to the network or the disk or having a file system, those will, someone will need to implement it. Well, uh, since things that are traditionally part of the kernel and would therefore be trusted code are now running in user space, the line between trusted and untrusted code gets a little blurry, it seems, or could potentially anyway. And there's like more potential if, since it's so modular, people could swap out chunks and then could cause problems. I don't know. Yeah, it seems like they're potentially. Um, Yeah, it seems like maybe we have to worry about kind of rogue libraries. Like, uh, are we using um, are we using a, a file system that actually is like just full of bugs or like does really bad or, or weird stuff? Um, and so, yeah, the kernel's smaller, and so maybe it's easier to trust the kernel. But maybe we've just like deferred this trust problem to these other parts of the system. I was also just going to say, like, there's this you know, security question since you're going to underuse your processes for stuff that you should probably hope is secure. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, the, the kinds of guarantees the kernel is going to be able to provide. Definitely, we made the kernel smaller and correspondingly, and what it can promise you, also smaller. Huh? Also, we have, like, the direct. Developers with the direct access to hardware now. So, like, there's kind of no care. It's really hard to guarantee a file system or just is going to be like, everything is like segmented because you can just do whatever you want. Like, the little process can do whatever it wants from the disk whenever it wants. Or not, but, like, the problem kind of seems like. Um, well, the process can send a message to the file system or to the disk driver. Um, and these modules could implement some sort of like. We're like, not going to. Can you not like, just like, make your own disk driver yourself? And, like, can, is there like, a limit to like, one disk driver per kernel? Like, how does that um, Yeah, so. Yeah, so I, I, I suppose that that's fair. You could launch your Scrum kind of own, own disk driver. Um, uh, yeah, so it. So, Possibly kind of microkernels uh, not appropriate for kind of a multi-user system. For example, if there's going to be people using the system who you don't trust, like might might not be a, a, a great use case. And then uh, I should say that things that were usually like one system call to right to use the file system now you have to make a system call and then have that interact with the file system process and then the file system process to make another system call to go back and interact with the app. Yeah, this is uh, this is the real killer. Um, that we There's like a whole lot of chit chat between these different user processes via this, the, this whatever inner process communication mechanism there is. Uh, and when this kind of init uh, uh, microkernel mock came out, it was super slow because the IPC was slow. Uh, and this caused people to just sort of dismiss the idea of microkernels as just like not at all practical because you couldn't ever make them fast because of all this IPC. Turns out you can, and we'll talk uh, about how, how you can do that. But yes, this is. This is a major challenge you have to solve to make these systems really useful. Jimmy? Oh, uh, another like, more technical question. So in, in, in our operating system, in, in our operating system, we have a lot of dependency, right? So a lot of files refer to the same SF.h. 
and then so like in, in, in that system of like uh, each of the process needs as uh, fs dot h to work so essentially you still need like a big library to build against is that um so because all these processes communicate through IPC, really the only system calls the kernel has to provide are mostly those related to making inter process communication work. Because to do something with the file system, you just need to send some message to the file system process that it understands like how to handle. So um, yeah, the app, like the file system process has some sort of uh, like has some API or like set of messages it understands, uh, and then applications sort of communicate with it through that. Um, and that way, these pieces are kind of much more modular. That um, kind of an OSV, if you wanted to replace the file system, like you wrote out the file system. Uh, it touches so many different parts, like so many different parts of the system, like assume certain things about, about the file system. You might have to like make major changes where um, here you're still just using the same system call, same IPC to the file system module. Uh, so in that sense, it's maybe much easier to kind of take out pieces and, and replace them, that sort of thing. Um, other challenges? Well, I mean, this is true of making any new kernel, not just a microkernel. And but like, unless you're using some like established framework for building microkernels, and unless you're like 100% proving it's secure, then you lose the benefit of all of like the crowdsourced security wisdom of like all the years of like Linux and Windows bug fixes. Um, although you also lose all the accumulated undocumented vulnerabilities in those systems. But yes, fair point. Um, basically, yeah, there's bar barriers to, to adoption, but also we need to actually have, there are some sort of primitives that we will need, like fork or some way to create new processes and sort of, you know, all the components in, in the rest of the operating system. Well, I guess I'm just curious conceptually, because I guess I had thought that, like, of the undiscovered bugs in, like, big operating systems, that we thought they were mostly memory problems, but then, like, the ones that weren't, I guess, why would you assume that if you're following like typical like this is how you make an operating system that you that if there's something that people haven't figured out with the bug that you wouldn't also make the same mistake solving the same problem? Um, I mean, it, it, I'm more thinking about code size. The people have done studies for like every thousand lines of code, you expect five major bugs. Or uh, people people have studied this, kind of measured this, um, and so just by kind of making something smaller and simpler, you would expect kind of fewer of the, you would expect fewer bugs overall. Um, and if you're like in the case where you're like taking the existing Linux kernel and adding onto it, kind of all those um, hundreds of thousands of lines of code like are coming along with whatever bugs currently exist in it. Um, all right, so I want to, to, to tell you about the, uh, a bit about this L4 system. Um, but I also want to tell you about Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, so Eisenhower, uh, as you may know, um, was a uh, general in, in World War II, became the kind of supreme commander of allied forces in, in Europe. Here he is talking to um, uh, paratroopers before they would uh, parachute in, into France in 1944. Um, and uh, he was a very well known, very popular figure. Um, people didn't really know much about his politics, so sort of both the Democrats and Republicans were like saying, "Hey, Eisenhower, you want to, you know, be president for for us?" Um, and uh, he ended up running as as a Republican, um, 
uh, uh, fairly um, fairly moderate. He had a, a great campaign slogan, I like Ike. And Dwight Eisenhower's nickname was, was Ike. Um, and he, he won pretty convincingly um, versus uh, uh, Adelaide Stevenson. Um, this is 1952 where Stevenson got creamed and the decision the Democratic Party made in 1956 was let's run Stevenson again. And same thing happened. Didn't, didn't go any better. Um, so uh, I've Eisenhower um, dealt with kind of various domestic policy things as the president does, moved, um, is often criticized for moving like very slowly to not at all in terms of civil rights um, during this period, though um, notably he did send uh, uh, the U.S. Army to enforce um, uh, desegregation um, following the Brown the Board of Education decision in the Supreme Court. Um, but uh, most people uh, think of him as kind of the, uh, a leader during the beginning of, of the Cold War. Uh, and so kind of at, in 1953, uh, you have the, uh, the dark blue countries, or those at the, the NATO, uh, uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, kind of military alliance. Um, the blue, uh, the lighter blue countries are those that were considered kind of Western aligned, kind of allies of, of the U.S., or at least favorable to the U.S., um, you know, the, the Soviet Union and the countries that had had some amount of direct control over the government in dark red, uh, and then kind of, uh, Soviet aligned countries in, in lighter red. Um, and at this time, all the green countries were those that were still uh, colonized by uh, uh, mostly uh, Britain and France, uh, although I think the Dutch also had um, uh, uh, colonial. Territory in the uh, in Indonesia and um, a, a kind of a, a complicated uh, thing that un unfolded very quickly during this time um, uh, was the, the the decolonization or kind of uh, um, many of the the areas that were under um, and had been under colonial control for many years suddenly. Uh, new borders were drawn, uh, new constitutions were quickly written up, um, and uh, while a, uh, a, po a positive step, this was a kind of messy and often very violent process, and, and of course the uh, relevant to, to, to U.S. history in particular, uh, the French fought a war in what's called French Indochina, um, the, the French had gotten kicked out by the Japanese um, and during the war, and at the end of the war, just tried to reimpose colonial rule um, in its entirety, um, fought a war against uh, um, uh, communist aligned uh, Vietnamese. Um, the US watched this war go very badly, supported it, and then just took over and made all the same mistakes um, uh, about 15 years later. Uh, but that, that's a tangent, not about Eisenhower, so better get back to, uh, to uh, uh, operating systems. Um, all right, so I uh, want to talk about kind of basic, kind of basic abstractions of this L4 uh, microkernel. Um, Uh, it uh, it's basically has an equivalent to to the Linux process uh, called a task, uh, and each task uh, has its own address space. So it's kind of each task has its, its set of virtual memory, like we're we're used to, and um, each task also has kind of one or more um, threads uh, uh, running inside of it. So uh, OSV, we have a single thread per process, like a single kernel thread per process. Um, uh, in, in L4, kind of multiple threads can exist uh, as part of a task. And one of the things that, so our, our, uh, our 
microkernel here provides our IPC. Uh, it also does it also does the schedule. So these kind of threads inside a task, they are scheduled uh, by the microkernel. Um, this is the design decision of L4. You could have a microkernel where the scheduler itself was some, some user, user process. Um, so to give a sense of, of the uh, emphasis on minimality, uh, on smallness here, uh, Linux, something like uh, well over 300 system calls available in Linux. Um, OSV, I look today, uh, it's kind of 19 or maybe 22 if you count the calls that are just for like testing purposes to like get some information out of the kernel. Uh, L4 had a whopping seven system calls. So really minimal API um, that, the, that the kernel is going to provide. Um, and like I said, it's about 13,000 lines of code, which roughly the size of OSV. Um, so what are these? Uh, what are these system calls? Um, you need to be able to kind of create an address space, um, which is basically means like create a task. Um, we uh, can create and destroy threads. Um, one very interesting thing about the way these tasks work and the way that they manage memory uh, is that when a task creates another address space, uh, it can kind of donate some of its own address space to the new task, uh, as well as set up shared memory between the two of them. So this is all taking place in, in um, uh, so like the, the task says, Okay, microkernel, create this this new task. Um, take this part of my memory and kind of map it into set up the page tables in this task to to use that same that same memory. Um, and another kind of interesting uh, because you'll notice like. What's, what's a major thing that you have helped implement in OSV that is like missing from this picture of, of the L4 kernel? Um, yeah, what specifically have... Translation. Uh, well, so you didn't implement translation, like what have you implemented? In, in, page fault? Yeah, the page fault. Like there, the pa there's no like paging system inside this kernel. And in fact, typically each task has a pager task. And a page fault takes the form of send an IPC to the pager, which because tasks can uh, interact with each other's address spaces, the pager task can like do the page fault for you. This also means that different tasks can customize how page faults work for that task. Um, which seems like a potentially potentially powerful um, uh, uh, powerful thing. Um, all right, uh, I want to make sure that I uh, there's more detail I could get into, but I want to make sure to talk about the, this IPC performance issue because that's that's a real uh, a real problem that they had to solve. Um, So I want to uh, first sort of outline sort of a, a slow but straightforward implementation of uh, IPC. We have some some process. Uh, it calls send with the ID of some process it's sending to and some message it's sending, uh, and there's there's some queue inside the kernel, may sound familiar, um, 
from, from lab three, uh, but we put the message into, into the queue. Um, and there's some other process that itself makes a kind of receive um, uh, system call uh, that sort of gets out the, uh, the message from, from the queue. Um, but typically, with this sort of message passing, it, it's often of the form Often, what we would think of as a remote procedure call or RPC, which is like we want this to act like calling a function. So, process A wants to sort of call a function in process B and then get back kind of the results of that function. So, you think just like a system call, you pass in inputs, the kernel does something, and it like gives you back some return value. So, to actually do this sort of two way thing, a has to send, B has to receive, then B has to send the reply, and A has to like receive the reply. So we end up with like four calls into the kernel um, to do this sort of straightforward but very slow IPC. Uh, does that make sense? Questions on this? So what do they do to make it faster? Uh, they, oh, so I should say that this style is buffered, meaning how you could queue up multiple messages, uh, and it's asynchronous. So A can send, send returns, and then sometime later B, B can receive. So in L4, We have synchronous and unbuffered uh, inter-process communication, uh, which means that process A wants to uh, uh, send a message, and process A waits in send until the recipient receives. So that's the synchronous part. Um, and unbuffered means that like uh, there's not some queue of, of waiting messages. Like anyone who's sending to B is sitting there waiting for B to receive, uh, in kind of uh, like waiting in, in with a condition variable or something like this, kind of sleeping, waiting for, for B to wake them up and, and receive. So the sort of assumption of this is that. We have sort of a client server model between A and B. That our expectation is that B is maybe uh, um, uh, some sort of service uh, that's running, and it's just sitting in a loop waiting to receive messages. And so and whenever someone sends to it, uh, unless it happens to be in the middle of processing another message, it's already kind of sitting in the kernel kind of waiting to receive. Um, and uh, kind of the particular uh, neat idea that they used was that uh, when A goes into send, um, that basically just goes jumps directly into B as if it was returning from the receive call. So that is to say that, that you don't need to involve the whole scheduling machinery, context switch, wait for a timer interrupt, and if A send just kind of immediately uh, returns into uh, the receiving the receiving process, um, and if we have small messages, we can send those directly via registers. We don't have to kind of copy into memory at all. Uh, if we have huge messages, uh, we can use that trick where we just like give the the recipient part of our address space. Um, or, or just modify the page table so that they can access the contents of this, this large message. Um, and kind of all of these uh, uh, various optimizations made this IPCP, IC, IPC about 20 times faster 
uh, than, than this slow version. Uh, and so this was uh, uh, really the, the response to, well, microkernels are too slow to ever be practical. Well, someone figured out how to make them kind of competitive performance-wise uh, uh, with, with traditional kernels. Um, so I'll, I'll put in the, I'll, I'll, add, uh, I'll add to the notes for today uh, a link to a paper about L4 um, that was demonstrating that you could actually like run Linux itself, kind of a port Linux to L4 and like run it as a user process. And it was only like five or six percent slower what? Um, than running Linux natively. Um, and yeah, this was their, their saying, look, microkernels are, are, are the real deal. Well, Sorry, I don't mean to do real things first week, but I know we have 10 minutes left. Um, I was just curious, the first model there, mm -hmm. it seems really familiar to me, like in a lot of other modern usages outside of operating systems. Like, I think that's exactly like the way WebAssembly communicates with like the process. Yeah, Would, very like, common. Other applications of that pattern be faster if they are switched to the latter, or is it different uses, different? Um. Well, this sort of depends that you can like modify the instruction pointer and like do the kind of magic to make it like jump right here. Or particularly if you're like doing stuff over networks, like that doesn't really make any sense. Um, so I do think like this approach. I'm sure this is not the only situation where it could be useful, um, but it does depend on being able to to kind of access sort of memory and, and both of these or like mess around with the register context to make it work. Um, which is not, this pattern is going to show up all sorts of places where that's not feasible. Other questions? All right, so what's, where are our microkernels today? Um, uh, Apple devices have something called, a, a, they have a dedicated processor for cryptographic stuff called their Enclave processor. L4 runs on that processor. Um, it runs on a bunch of Qualcomm phones as, as well, um, so it's actually out there um, running in practice. Uh, however, microkernels like never caught on for general purpose computing. You can't go out and buy a laptop that comes pre-installed with some some microkernel, um, and it's really because, like, from a user's perspective, there's like not necessarily a compelling story with, with where you would want to switch from Linux to one of these microkernels. So it's like useful. In, uh, and, and used in, in particular circumstances, but many, as I said, many of the ideas um, like sophisticated virtual memory, like kind of these these with, like the idea with these pager processes has been has been picked up. Uh, Linux added loadable kernel modules, so Linux you can sort of customize it on the fly, um, kind of trying to to get some of the flexibility you get from a from a microkernel. Um, uh, and the Mac OS actually uses this kind of IPC. Um, uh, people came up with this very efficient idea tied to microkernels, but it turns out useful in other, in other contexts. Um, all right, so to just talk briefly about this unikernel idea. Um, is it like you don't. You no longer have any separation between kernel and user space. Um, like before, we had the kernel and the user, and what we're doing instead is just eliminating this line. And the application code and the kernel are just one big program. Uh, and the idea is that we have a Kind of a purpose-built kernel that's intended to run kind of one specific application, or maybe some small number of applications. Um, so uh, this is something I've, I've uh, had a kind of small research project on myself with the idea of um, if someone demonstrated that you could implement this kind of unikernel. Uh, in this case, for an extremely simple application of just printing hello, um, but that a unikernel, which kind of uh, booted up in a virtual machine, um, kind of, I guess one thing is that the unikernel isn't going to have like a bunch of device drivers 
inside of it. These are sort of specifically intended to run on top of virtual machines that sort of are actually what is talking to the hardware. Um, but you could boot up a unit kernel in a virtual machine, and it was almost as fast as if you had just launched a Linux process. Um, which, in terms of like a virtual machine that is as fast as the process, is sort of like amazingly small overhead. And so um, uh, we've taken a kind of more meaningful task of generating a thumbnail for a PNG image. And as you just like write the code to generate the thumbnail directly into a very small kernel that can boot up and literally all it does is take a PNG as input and send one out. Um, and uh, I have, uh, have done kind of some benchmarking to say um, this kind of unit kernel is indeed if you're doing Docker or booting up uh, uh, Linux, the full Linux kernel in Kimu, indeed this, this unit kernel is much faster. Um, but um, turns out there are, are a number of, of unit kernels uh, out there used for different things. Um, there is one called OSV. Uh, no relation to our OSV at all. Um, but uh, if you Google OSV, you'll almost certainly find stuff about this unit kernel and not about our kernel. Um, uh, and these are, I should say, these unit, this unit kernel is kind of more recent idea in kernel design than, than microkernels because it's sort of specifically tied to this virtual machine cloud computing idea that uh, if we want a server that's like, say, taking, like, taking requests to generate PNG thumbnails, and we don't want these requests to interfere with each other, um, we kind of want to, to start off a virtual machine to handle each request. Um, and in that case, we want the kind of kernel that the virtual machine is putting up to be as like little overhead as possible. And so if you just take the specific application, the bare minimum that you need from a kernel to make that work, and you sort of deploy that as like a single program. And kind of everything is running at, at, uh, uh, at the privilege level. Does that make sense? Questions on that? Um, another kind of interesting strategy that is used uh, for uh, unit kernels is uh, you kind of write some application uh, and then um, this and a particular one that I'm thinking of is one called Mirage OS, um, which is written in the functional programming language OCaml. Um, but the idea is you write an application in OCaml. Um, The code for this app is analyzed by kind of the Mirage OS build system. Um, and what you get out is a kernel that has your application and exactly the modules that the application needs from the kernel because it's analyzed your code and say, okay, you need networking, you need uh, virtual memory, uh, but you don't need um, file system, you don't need some graphical interface, and so on. So uh, a unit kernel as a sort of framework where a bunch of different modules are implemented, and it's actually some system. I mean, you could do this manually, but there are also, in some cases, an automated system that sort of figures out what pieces it needs to plug together to give you exactly sort of the kernel you need. When you said this is faster than running on just a single process on Linux or whatever? Uh, no, the idea is you could get it um, this sort of, the, the paper I was referring to showed that you could get almost as fast as just 
starting a new process. Um, uh, it would be impressive if you could get it faster, but that, that seems maybe a little far fetched. Well, Did something like AWS Lambda do this instead of the whole runtime? Yes, th these sort of unit kernels um, are uh, like one of the compelling use cases uh, is what's called. Serverless computing, which confusingly does not mean there's no server. Like this is an extremely poor name, but it is what people use. It means that there's no, uh, there's not a server that's like remembering anything about some kind of the, the previous requests or connections or, or users. It's just like, and um, to Will's question, AWS Lambda is kind of this kind of service where like you say, here's a function. I want to implement, like PNG thumbnail generation. And then that is kind of the lambda, the function that, that uh, is being provided. And then in this serverless computing environment, you just want some uh, machine connected to the internet that can kind of take in a request that has like an input to this function and spit back out the output. Um, and yeah, being able to have these really lightweight unit kernels in this serverless computing environment is sort of the, uh, the reason, the main reason people are, are excited about them. Um, and there's been a fair amount of research on, like, can we make Docker, like, run, be more performant in these serverless computing or developing new kind of lightweight VMs that, that target this sort of environment. So it's, uh, I would say it's one of the, one of the hot topics in, in operating systems research right now. All right, we're basically out of time, so I'll stop there. Um, there's the, the quiz due Friday. We'll be in the lab uh, on Friday, and I will see you then or office hours on Thursday.